Well, I want to introduce the Professor Patterson, Professor Emeritus at Berkeley, uh, one of the key computer architects of our age. And obviously, he has been involved with a number of uh, important computing architecture that we are using today around the world. So what I'd like to do is really start with his uh, involvement in this idea of risk architecture, which you may not know, some of you know, but some of you may not know, which is a reduced instruction set computer design, which Professor Patterson pioneered while at UC Berkeley. And you also coined the term risk. So for our audience who doesn't know much about this, it'll be great if you can talk about what is risk and how we got there and uh, what is the significance of risk uh, for, the, uh, for our uh, uh, computing architecture that we're enjoying today? Okay, well, let's, if I answer all of that at once, it'll be a long answer, so <laughs> I might break it up on. Let, let, let's talk about uh, what the idea is. Uh, so when hardware talks to software, um, it has to use a vocabulary that the hardware understands. And the technical name for that vocabulary that the computer understands is an instruction set or instruction set architecture. So that's just what we call it. So what are the, what are the words of the vocabulary? Well, you've, you've seen them. It's like the keys of the calculator. So there's add is a word, subtract, multiply, divide. There's, you know how you can save numbers away in a calculator so you don't have to type in it all the time where there's instructions like that. So kind of remarkably, uh, what software is, is just millions of these very simple instructions, but executed billions of times, billions of times a second. And that we get this software comes out of it. But so, but the instruction set part of the reduced instruction set name is the vocabulary of the hardware. Now, what, what's the reduced part of it mean? Well, um, in around 1980, when uh, John N. Hennessy, who was uh, at Stanford and I were working at the same topic, which was we thought microprocessors, even though that time they were just like in microwaves, basically, that were going to be the future of computing because Morse law is we're going to get every year more resources and they were getting more and more powerful. And we asked is what's the best vocabulary for a microprocessor? And it should be, it should be the same as the vocabularies of the big computers of the time. Uh, and that's the question we asked. And we came to the conclusion that given the fast movement of Moore's law, it would make a lot more sense to keep uh, the instructions to be simple, reduced, uh, that that would be a better design than having them big and complicated or our complex instruction sets. So it sounds really simple. And obviously, a person like me who started my career at Intel Corporation, which had a, some other approach, and clearly risk came in as a, a simplified and the reduced instruction set architecture. And today, of course, these products are billions and billions of products uh, that we use every day, uh, from the mobile phones to the tablets, all the way to servers. So it'll be great if you can talk a little bit about the difference between the different architecture, particularly Intel 86, which a lot of people know that the original Intel processors, uh, typically we are known as CISC, and then there's RISC, and then there's some kind of hybrid. So if you can give some uh, clarity around that, I think it maybe help the audience. Okay, uh, but you know, kind of continuing the story, there's what we call RISC, the reduced instruction set, and CISC, the complex. Well, what was the argument, the technical argument? Well, the technical argument was, well, if there's reduced instructions, you're going to have to execute more of them. Just like um, uh, you could imagine if, if you're reading a page and it had lots of polysyllabic words, there might not be as many of these big words on the page as, as if they were very simple words. But on the other hand, you might be able to read the, the simple words much faster. So what's that kind of trade-off? You have to read more of them, but you can read them faster. And so what the risk investigations discovered is you maybe read 20, 30% more of the, comp of the simple ones, but you can execute them maybe five times faster. So the net effect was a kind of a factor of four. It's also, it needs less hardware itself. So it tended to be that the risk architectures could be faster and they could use, they could be smaller and use less power. 
I talked about the uh, the different classes of computers. So there's the things that are you know in your cell phone, in your laptop, and then in these big servers in the cloud. So for the big servers, the, the kind of the power benefits and the, the size benefits didn't matter as much. These are chips that can cost $500 or $1,000 that uh, typically a company like Intel's makes. So um, it, you know, it, it didn't matter as much. And what Intel cleverly did is kind of amazingly, in hardware, they would translate the sys instructions into risk instructions on the fly. It's kind of an amazing engineering feat. Now, that was extra hardware to do that, and it, it took extra power, but for servers, that didn't matter. And so in the server marketplace today, still the x86 architecture still dominates, but the power and uh, cost advantages of risk means it dominates the smaller devices. So virtually every cell phone has a risk processor in it. Uh, and on average, because there's more processors in cell phones and things that go in cars than there are in data centers, about 99% of the processors are risk. But there's a small percentage of big chips that go into the servers that tend to be CISC. Yeah, in some ways I look at even, even us, right? If I look at the, um, uh, this Go champion, they were competing against the um, big, large, deep mine team with a large number of servers, I think it was 167 servers or something like that, competing against one human brain, although human brain did lose eventually, but in, in this remarkable, right, the power that was used in our brain was only about 20 watt equivalent, but yet we have uh, almost 100 billion neurons that are connected and addressing the uh, computer requirements. And here is the huge computers taking a lot of power to solve these very similar issues. So sometimes I look at human brains as one of really clever multi-processing risk set architecture that are out there trying to compete against this gigantic power machines. I don't know whether you have any insights around human yeah, biology. I mean, the, yeah, the only, I mean, the human brain's amazing, right? Like you said, it's, uh, the, only, the only problem is it took, you know, a billion years to evolve, right? <laughs> 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 Uh, and, uh, and, you know, right now, kind of interestingly for the, kind of for the first time, there's things, uh, there's things that humans could do better than any machine. And now where we are in terms of building hardware and how fast it goes and how much hardware we can build versus there's things that machines can do better than humans now. And, um, you know, it's an, that makes for interesting times. Mm -hmm. It's finally catching up in some ways. So let me kind of go back to the question a lot of people are asking, right? Because I think the Intel's uh, x86 and the other architecture has been there for, you know, high performing server data center type of applications. And the uh, many devices in IoT, VR, AR, mobile phones was a risk architecture. ARM um, is a great example of beneficiary of that architecture as well. Where do you see today in terms of the performance and power, which is a very critical trade-up on the risk five versus the x86, and where do you think it's going? Well, yeah, you, meant, you mentioned risk five, so let me explain what risk five is. So that I can tell you the, where the name came from and then tell you the significance. So basically in the 1980s, we did uh, four risk projects, that I, the efforts that I led. And we gave them, we called the first ones risk one and risk two, and we came up with other names, the other two. And uh, I told the students at Berkeley, you know, that was a marketing mistake. Risk was a really great name. I should have called them risk one, risk two, risk three, risk four. Well, what happened in around 2010 is uh, my colleagues at Berkeley, led by my uh, professor, Chris Osanovich, that it's time to do a brand new risk construction set, learn from the mistakes of the 1980s, do a clean sheet, better design. And we'll call it risk five. And we, and we did that for academic research. Um, these vocabularies that I talked about, uh, like the Intel vocabulary, well, we think our, the risk vocabulary is better, but besides that, Intel owns that vocabulary and you're not allowed to use it. And so we wanted to do our research. So we wanted to have a good instruction set that we could do our research was that nobody would, would stop us from doing it. And, we were hoping other academics would use it, but what happened to our surprise 
is in people in industry started using it. We developed it for ourselves and, and we made it open. It's kind of the Berkeley tradition. You put things into the public domain so everybody can benefit. So we put in the public domain and there was a thirst for an open instruction set architecture that the other instruction sets, the other vocabulary, somebody owns them and you have to pay money to use them. They were very interested in instruction sets of uh, vocabularies that they could use uh, without constraints, um, particularly they could improve them in that. So that's what risk five is about. So there's kind of the original risk ideas from the 1980s for which, you know, Hennessy and I got the Turing Award, that those ideas. And then there's the modern new idea, which is an open instruction set architecture. So that's kind of a bit, this is a business model uh, innovation. And there's huge enthusiasm around that. For those who know the software industry, you know, 20 years ago uh, or so, Linux was kind of a, you know, something a few academics cared about, but then the idea of an open um, source operating system caught on and IBM supported it and other companies supported it. And now it's, you know, it's the industrial standard. So I think some of that same enthusiasm is around uh, risk five. So the uh, clearly risk five is gaining momentum. And I see number of startups that I talk to are working with risk five architecture and the whole idea of open platform, openness is, I think, very attractive for many startups. And I uh, can also say that I've been a board member of ARM in the past, and uh, ARM is great for people who need to go into the business of building mobile phones and others because it's proven architecture. But it does have the uh, cost of doing license and license fees and dealing with particular architecture. So tell me about the benefit of this openness uh, that risk buy brings to the future. Yeah, so it, it, it kind of depends what kind of company you are. If you're a startup, it's extremely attractive because kind of, because if you're using a proprietary instruction set like ARM or like Intel, the first step that you have to do is negotiate a contract, which can take months. And it uses up your startup money. You got to spend that money. So step one is, Negotiate a contract with the supplier of your processor. With RISC-V, because it's open, you can just say, I'm going to use RISC-V and just get started because nobody, everybody can use it. Later on, I'll figure out uh, who's going to supply the processor. And there are even examples of the processor itself being completely open. You can get it, get it for free or you can get it for companies. But startup companies don't have to go through the contract negotiation. You just get started. We're going to use RISC-V for this. So that's that's very attractive. There's also the money saved, you know, you don't have to pay the, the royalties, but I think the, mm -hmm. the time is almost is maybe as important as the other one. Mm -hmm. The other, there's a technical difference right now too. What we did at Berkeley uh, 10 years ago is uh, we knew with the slowing down of Moore's law that you're gonna wanna add custom words to your vocabulary because uh, just running the standard vocabulary faster is getting harder to do. So you wanted to be able to customize it. So we provided for that as part of RISC-5. And so that's another reason people are attracted to RISC-5 is we can customize it for our needs, uh, which is harder to do with proprietary instruction sets. So if you look at like Intel or ARM, um, which both companies I was involved with, clearly there is some governance by the company and being able to manage the ecosystem ensure there's a compatibility, ensure there is a, a cohesive ecosystem, right? That's the strength of this architecture and those companies were very successful doing it last 30, 40 years. The question I think of a, of a risk five is how do you then govern and how do you make sure the ecosystem harmonized and being able to have the right software tools, right quality, right uh, dependability around this ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what uh, the questions are today about it. It's if you're a company, you can hire people, you can tell them you got to do this. You know, you, you've got the here's this piece is missing. We're hiring people to do that thing. And and, you know, if they do it or they get fired or you hire somebody else. So you can be top down directed and make things happen. You know, things can take longer than you hope. But anyways, you, you can direct it to happen. What RISC V has is something called RISC V International, which is a foundation that kind of owns RISC V, like there's a Linux foundation. And it relies on volunteers to do this, uh, largely relies on volunteers. There's some paid staff 
at uh, Risk Five International, but largely it's coordinating volunteers who are enthusiastic about Risk Five and coordinating their efforts and getting to work on it. Or that's what we're watching happening. How well is a community organized effort that's kind of like a standardized effort where volunteers are working on it versus this kind of top down side of the company? How well is, is that going to work? On the software side, everybody relies on open source software. Right. The, the most important software for ARM and Intel is probably open source software. So that's kind of a little easier and that uh, open source software is not particularly company directed. You're, you're not excited about the Intel vocabulary because you're buying software from Intel or the ARM vocabulary because you're buying software from ARM. It's this open source. It's the standard software that comes from others. Almost all of it is open source. So getting the open source community to embrace an open architecture isn't as difficult. So uh, at least for many of the markets, uh, the, the software is coming, uh, is being addressed. And then we just have to see in terms of like compatibility tests and other things that the hardware companies do, will the open community be able to deliver with the same quality and same timeliness? And that's what we're kind of seeing how well it works right now. So clearly there's a benefit of that open community working together. We have seen Linux. I mean, in the beginning, it was kind of a hobby, it's kind of a computer science department projects to everything we do depend on Linux today, right? So we see the industrialization and robustness that happens over time when the people work together in the common community there. Where do you think the risk vibe could handle the, uh, the future workload uh, as you see the roadmap of uh, products that are coming out? So uh, it, right now, uh, and what we expected and what most people expected is in the embedded community on the edge, it's extremely popular. Uh, uh, I think, you know, it's what's a little different is it's people could use it without saying they're using it. But recently, Alibaba announced that they've been shipping RISC-V in their products, and they've shipped two and a half billion chips with, with that. So that's, you know, so it, to put it in perspective, I guess the, the x86 chip is maybe a third of a billion per year kind of number of chips. So just Alibaba by itself has is like 10 times that amount. Uh, and that's one company. So. In the, but the embedded space, it's, it's very popular. It's the size and the efficiency, the customization, uh, mm -hmm. it goes there. I think and then as the computers get bigger, uh, the challenges, um, uh, you know, then that's kind of the next size penetration. There's already um, RISC-V as kind of controllers in GPUs, all of NVIDIA GPUs and all of the, the disks from Western Digital and I think uh, from Seagate, the two main disk manufacturers are using RISC-V in their disks. So this kind of embedded space. Uh, next up would be uh, cell phones. And that would seem to be a hard target because uh, there's software you can install on your cell phone and it has to know the instruction sets. But there seems to be, uh, I think there has already been one uh, cell phone that was RISC-V, but there's starting to be some interest in that area. Uh, the kind of the hardest one is the servers uh, because uh, they're less sensitive on the uh, cost and the power, which is big advantage for RISC-V. But we've seen announcements, uh, at least, which x86, Intel used to own like 100% of that, where, where these vertical companies like Alibaba and Amazon Web Services and Google and Microsoft have made announcements, either they've announced products that they're not going to use just stick to x86 anymore they're going to do other instruction sets so we've seen announcements for around arm already so that's a, a big change of going to a risk architecture and you know those of us the risk 5 foundation can imagine that down the road uh, risk 5 will be a popular instruction set there so mm -hmm. you know as we said kind of when we jokingly said uh what's the goal of risk 5 when people asked us five years ago and it was world domination <laughs> Technically, we think that single vocabulary could run everywhere. We could have a, like a lingua franca, a single vocabulary that all hardware uses, which would be kind of a bold vision of what the future looks like. But technically, it's possible. We, we, it's certainly technically possible. And it's, there's benefits to it. And if we're going to have a lingua franca that 
all hardware understands, it's got to be open. You know, it can't be a lingua franca that everybody's going to use and somebody owns it and you pay pay uh, money on it. It'd be like if English was owned by some British company and for everybody to use it, we had to pay royalties. To use it. I mean, that doesn't make sense. It has to be an open architecture. So the kind of an exciting vision of the future of uh, you can run risk everything, every every type of computer in the world understands risk five and can use it. And well, and the communities, we have this kind of community development of it. And, uh, you know, we find that very compelling. Yeah, no, I see the, the particularly hybrid as well, the combination of ARM, RISC-V, and even Intel and others. So RISC-V clearly is now part of the uh, compute hybrid, uh, hybrid architecture that are solving particular applications. In fact, the, uh, the market research data that I show, I saw just for this interview, I was looking into what is the forecast on this thing. And 62.4 billion RISC-V CPU to be uh, the cores to be uh, uh, produced by 2025. That is a big number, right? I mean, 62 billion. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm on the uh, board of directors of the RISC-V International, but I am not, you know, in one of these companies that's shipping them. So it's harder for me to see, but. It, all the indications are, all the signs that I see is tremendous, tremendous uh, uptick. And uh, kind of the, the people who go to the events too have this kind of religious fervor. It's, it's similar to around open source software. People, open source software, just people like it, they believe in it, and they want to work for companies that, that, that do it, and they don't want to work for companies that do closed source software. So that same kind of enthusiasm is around this five that kind of have a religious fervor, excited to uh, tell people what risk five is and get people to use it. So we see this uh, kind of, you know, without any, much any work on our part, this kind of natural inclination for a lot of people to get behind the idea of an open architecture. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting too. Yeah, I know. I was just thinking about, um, you know, ARM um, had the uh, 100 billion processor shipped a few years ago. They just, you know, they just celebrate 200 billion. So these numbers are really growing. And it shows that uh, today's microprocessor architecture is everything we do, even automobiles, the phones, and others. So that just shows all the work you and your team has done is really fingerprints are everywhere that are being used, right? Maybe a one instruction set and risk, you know, maybe a couple hundred reduced instruction set, but they are being used in billions around the world. And that's really interesting implication to what we're living in. And the, uh, I'm actually curious about your thoughts around ARM's feature versus risk by uh, and the particularly given NVIDIA's position to acquire um, uh, ARM uh, as a part of where it is today. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so when uh, we were making the arguments for an open architecture, uh, Chris Osanovich and I wrote a paper, I think in 2014, 15, one of the things we pointed out is with proprietary instruction sets, people can buy and sell them, right? <laughs> it's with an open architecture like Linux, you know, no company owns it, it kind of everybody owns it. So it's kind of going to last forever and the ownership is going to change. We point out, you, Somebody can buy the instruction set and you may not, it may be a competitor that would buy it. And how would you feel about that? And that was kind of a theoretical argument. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, what, what happened uh, recently is, uh, you know, Arm was uh, its own company and then they got bought by uh, the software company from Japan. SoftBank. Uh, SoftBank, right. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is, you know, they don't have any fight any dogs in the fight that they're not a technology company they're an investment company so i don't you know it's possible that the money that they borrowed to buy arm affected the prices of the arm products but people weren't afraid of softbank as a owner of it nvidia is a very uh, significant competitor in the marketplace you know they they've gone from uh their value was i don't know one tenth of Intel to they're more valuable than Intel in, in maybe five or six or seven years. It's just remarkable. So they're, you know, an aggressive, very good, um, uh, talented company. 
So they're not a neutral provider. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a force in the marketplace. And so if that worries some people, right, is, you know, is if, if we compete with NVIDIA and they own ARM, is any bad, anything bad going to happen with that? It's not that it necessarily will, but it's a, con it's a concern. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I, I'm not like I'm, I'm ex not that I expect ARM to play hardball. I mean, NVIDIA to play hardball with ARM, but just people worry about it. Uh, and, and, and I think the, uh, I think the purchase isn't yet completed yet. I think it's still working its way through various approval processes. So I'm not quite sure how to work, but, but the idea that people could buy the instruction set is being well demonstrated and that I think that does add for some companies to their enthusiasm for risk five is having instruction set that no competitor can buy that nobody controls. It's kind of everybody's instruction set. Yeah. What's clear is that after looking at a number of different architectural choices between CPUs and MPUs and GPUs, it takes a long time to establish a uh, standard architecture and it actually takes a very long life cycle. And the, uh, you've seen that ARM doing that for 30 years, Intel 40 years. So these things are very long journey. And clearly risk five is in a journey as well. You said 10 years, probably it's going to go through its own journey over, over time. Um, and I would love to hear about your view of the future of computer processors, uh, where we are going from where we are particularly given that there is a whole bunch of discussion around AI and machine learning based solutions that can deploy it widely. And that's just only growing with the given amount of data that are generating around the world. Yeah, so I, I, what I, uh, now that I'm a professor emeritus, I started working uh, part-time at Google. And where I'm working at Google is building hardware for machine learning. They, they call it uh, the Tensor Processing Unit or TPU. And so I, I would, you know, I'm involved, but I would think Google is plausibly the commercial leader in hardware for machine learning. So um, it's and, and this is a very exciting time, right? Uh, we've had artificial intelligence around forever. That phrase has been around since 1950. And for that field, it would made all these promises of what was going to happen. You know, in five, this amazing thing is going to happen in five or 10 years. It didn't happen. So there'd be this kind of AI winter and then people get excited again, make big promises. And it kind of went up and down like that and with promises made, but not kept for a lot of the AI work. Within what's called AI, there's this group that, uh, that thought the, the standard way of doing AI, that's the wrong way to do it. And for the standard way of doing AI, it was kind of top down is that we're going to write down a bunch of rules, kind of like, if when this happens, do this, when this happens, do that. And, it, and the theory was, if you got all the rules right, intelligence would emerge. Inside of what's generally called AA was this group called machine learning. They said, no way, you'll never do that. Humans cannot write down those rules. The only hope we have is for machines to look through the data and the machines to build the rules themselves. You, we will never top down do that. So there was this kind of, debate inside of AI between the machine learning people and the AI people. And then within machine learning, there was a debate. <laughs> there was this neural networking model where they said, we'll be inspired by the brain, the synapses in the brains, and we're going we're gonna to take data that's been labeled. It's like, here are pictures. This is a picture of a Cheshire cat. Here's a picture of a Cocker Spaniel dog. And they'll be labeled, and we'll use this neural network model to train it. So there was AI, machine learning, and neural networks. And what's happened in the last decade is that small piece, the neural networking piece, has wiped out everything else. <laughs> it, it's just going gangbusters. And basically what happened is we had the clouds. There was a lot more data, you know, a lot more data to analyze that, that you could label and much faster processors, tremendously fast processors. So when you make things about 10,000 times more data and 10,000 times faster, suddenly this machine learning place has taken off. And you, when you, you've been reading in the last five or 10 years about all these breakthroughs and quote AI, it really is machine learning and it really is the neural networking piece of machine learning that's delivering on these amazing results. For example, the Lee Sadal example of Go, uh, 
Go is, you know, this really difficult game. The first computer uh, that could play checkers better than a human was like 30 years ago and playing chess was 25 years ago. But there was almost no progress on Go for 20 years. And then suddenly they started using the neural networking approach and it went from routine players could beat the best computer game to the other way. Now uh, no human can beat Go and it's called this uh, neural networking. Okay. So that was kind of where we are into the AI stuff. What's going, what's going on in the hardware side of this? Because it's called machine learning. That means you need, need a lot of machines. Well, Moore's law, this amazing prediction uh, 55 years ago that the resources would double every year or two is coming to an end. You know, it's, it's slowing down. So right when we need a lot of machines for machine learning, the hardware is petering out. I mean, the too much power, too expensive, and basically you cannot keep up with the, the curve that was predicted or observed by uh, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel. Yeah, it, it's, it, and, uh, and it's just even, um, it's getting much more expensive to try and make that next step. And the steps aren't as good, are, are, the steps are taking longer to make, and they're not that as much better as they used to be. It used to be like clockwork, and he's doubling every year or two, and you could just count on it and for, for decades, and kind of the whole economy is counted on, and that is over. Or it's, it's not that it's not getting, it's still getting better, but much more slowly and not as fast. So what are we going to do? We need faster machines to do machine learning, and the transistors are, are not getting that much better. So what we do is, I told you about that vocabulary. So there are now efforts of building vocabulators that are just for neural networks of machine learning. That's all they do. They'll leave everything else to the standard microprocessors, all the software we run every day, operating systems, user interface and stuff. But to do the part for machine learning, we're gonna have a special vocabulary just for that. And that's an example of that is what I mentioned, the TPU. Mm -hmm. And you know, those have been doing really well. And, you know, giant factors of improvement over uh, standard processors. But they, you know, they're kind of like idiot savants, right? They do one thing really well, mm -hmm. and it just turns out this machine learning is very valuable. And so that's, right. that's so basically tuning particular hardware accelerator they can repeat really well in their particular instruction sets. Yeah, it, it, what basically is the standard instruction sets have to run all software, and so they have a bunch of general purpose features. If we know, if you know you're only doing machine learning, you can throw many of those things out. You can put more resources in that just help machine learning, but don't help the other ones. So by specializing, you can get still big speed ups, despite the transistors aren't, you know, doing that well. This used to not work. You know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, special purpose processors, people, what are you nuts? You know, just wait for Moore's law. It'll get. It, you can't keep up. You can't catch it. So that used to be a bad idea, and now. It's come back, and as far as we know, it's the only path forward. And just kind of serendipitously, we need to specialize in our target areas. And then machine learning turned up to be an extraordinarily attractive area. We're not quite sure how far machine learning is going to go, how many things it's going to revolutionize, but it's a lot already. And so that it makes it an inviting target for the specialized architecture. And the tie into risk five is this, you know, you could add custom instructions, you can add machine learning instructions to risk five. And so that right. kind of ties it. Lee Putin, as you know, the CEO of Cadence, and I've also been investing together in some of the hardware acceleration companies, whether it's a Havana that was acquired by Intel or yeah. Samanova. Yeah, and uh, Samanova is a new, another exciting one too. Yeah, you've got good taste. There, there were a hundred startups out of there Many of them are not successful, but yeah. Habana and Samanova seems very promising. Right. So it's very interesting how sometimes this old idea can come in as a new idea and change, change, change the, the, the uh, pr perspective. But I want to get your perspective about 10 years out because, you know, what you do, it takes time, right? So if you project 10 years out, what do you, what do you see in terms of a compute, in terms of the, the kind of workload you can handle, and the, uh, uh, what are the sort of architecture changes that are gonna happen? Yeah, so the, 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 there's, um, 
I think uh, a few things. One of them's pretty nerdy, and I'll see if I can explain it. Um, the way, uh, the, the, the standard way we've been building microprocessors, which, you know, drive, I think, are the driver of these economies, is Moore's law. And every year, the chip, the, the transistors get smaller and the chips would get bigger. And the simplest way to do it was to build one chip, just one chip. But they got bigger and bigger over time. And, but that, you know, it was still a great way. To, the safest, best way to build computers was increasing the chip size. And chips used to be the size of my thumbnail. And now they, they're sizes of bigger than postage stamps, you know, really big, uh, whatever is that, uh, two or three centimeters on a side, kind of remarkable. Mm -hmm. With the winding down of Moore's Law, what, uh, and, the, and the, these new technology steps are getting increasingly expensive. So the, the chips themselves are much more expensive than the latest technology and the older technologies. An alternative strategy is evolving, uh, which is called chiplets. And that instead of one big chip being your microprocessor, uh, being your computer, you build smaller chips and assemble them together in a package and then uh, that has potential, you know, the downside of the package might be a little bit more expensive and you have to communicate between these smaller chips. So there'll be some power and latency there. But we've seen examples uh, from AMD, the, the Intel's big competitor, that by doing it with smaller chips, you can actually have a much more attractive product. And so this chiplet idea is kind of... Uh, uh, is, is interesting and the potential is if we could go to a universal chiplet style so that if every uh, there would be a set of building blocks of these small chips that everybody could use you wouldn't have all the costs involved in making a brand new chip you could assemble it from these smaller chips so the possibility that the industry is kind of Moore's law wanes would revert kind of backwards the way it used to be of building a lot of small chips that everybody could use it is, you know, I think that's a pretty compelling vision of what the future might be. So uh, it's in the, and so the novelty would become is how do you package the, all these small chips that somebody else has already made rather than I'm going to design a brand new chip. So that would be a pretty big change. And I think there's kind of the forces at play might uh, well lead to that. Uh, and if it were to happen, it would make it much easier to design uh, new computers. Uh, and and you know, kind of, I know it was probably, no, it was before your time, but this is the way we used to design computers. In the 1960s and 70s, there was there were these catalogs and you, you could see all the chips you could buy and you would sell them together and that's how you built computers, uh, kind of. And then what happened with Moore's Law, you could, the, the chips could get bigger and bigger and you didn't need all those little ones, but we may need to go back to lots of small chips to be able to bring them all together. So that could, would we have a universal chip level? So that's, I don't know if people could follow that, but that's, that's, that's interesting. A, I, 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 yeah. So kind of summarizing uh, your perspective, first part, the chip size that professor talked about, we're talking about several hundred billions of transistors that are in one chip. Yeah. And this is why it's so big and so expensive and so much yeah. power it consumes, number one. And number two, uh, to package things, uh, you have to go smaller geometry. And today, five nanometer is where the latest products are. Next will be three nanometer, which is coming. And then next one is going to be probably two nanometer. And when it sounds like a smaller geometry sounds easy, but every time when you go to this geometry, it's really, really expensive and really, really hard to do, right? There's just another challenges. Right. Well, you know, kind of Intel's been in the news a lot, your, your former company. When we're talking about those technology nodes, they got to 10, they're, you know, they're a famous successful company, but, you know, engineering strength. And one of the reasons they were able to pull off this idea of translating from CIS construction to risk construction is Intel was two years ahead of everybody in the world, which is with Moore's law, that's a, like a factor of two or four times as many transistors. They had a two year ahead of everybody. But when it got to 10 nanometer, it made some choices about how they were going to uh, get to 10 nanometer that proved to be bad choices. And they, they went from a two year lead to the whole industry caught up with them 
to two years behind because of the the way they attacked it and other their competitors took a different path and were able to deliver on it. But it's it, but as we get to these nodes like five nanometer and three nanometer, the cost of the wafers, the chips that have come in these wafers, is going skyrocketing up, you know, is doubling and tripling, and it's taking longer to do. So it's really hard to get to these nodes. For some people, it's still the right thing to do is build a big chip in the latest node. But for a lot of people, the, these wafers are much more, the, this technology is much more expensive and it's not that much better than the old technology, depending on what you're doing. So why don't we build it from some of the older chiplets and the older technologies that'll reduce our costs rather than we have to build, you know, a hundred billion transistor chip in three nanometer, which would, is very expensive. So this is a, this is this would be kind of going like you said, kind of old ideas coming back, right? It's, mm. it's that it's kind of it'd be, you know, I would have been very surprised five years ago if somebody told me in whatever it is, uh, 10 years from now. So that's uh, 2030. We're going to be building it out of small pieces. Computers of the mm. future are going to be built out of little pieces. I would. What happened to Moore's law? You know, right. <laughs> after 50 <laughs> years of building bigger chips, what's going on? What, what happened? Yeah. What went wrong? Right. And so, but that that might be there. And if that happens, there will be. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what that does to the industry. You know, it could mm. be many companies building specialty chips that uh, mm. lots of people like to use. In, uh, so. In the, you know, the concept is really back to the future, in a way more decentralized architecture. In some ways, it's really imitating human brains, right? Because we have a many small processors that are connected in a very high speed synaptics. And that's exactly what you're describing, that we may go into much smaller processors that are connected in high speed interconnect, but it does require certain way of communicating with each other. It does require some kind of packaging innovation. So there's still a lot of room for innovation here. Oh, lots of room for innovations. But the good news is uh, uh, these companies, you know, uh, kind of the way the industry works, it used to be that if you were making microprocessors, you also had a semiconductor fab line that you owned in RAM, like Intel. Intel was the standard of that. And then Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company came up with a radical new idea is they didn't have any of their own chips, but they would make chips for other people. That's called the foundry approach. Uh, so the foundry kind of works well with the chiplet model, right? Uh, anybody can design them. Uh, you can make TSMEs can manufacture them for you. So small companies can do this and they can have a, a lot of these small chips together, but these foundries have their own packaging technology. They, they, they know how to put, these small chips together and can sell you a, a, a product. So you don't, it's not like we don't know how to put chiplets together. Kind of the challenges would be, can the industry reach agreement on a bunch of standards that they all embrace so that, you know, kind of grow the whole pie, right? The whole industry grows because it'll be much easier to design hardware. And we kind of need, as I said before, with this kind of ending a, the slowing down of Moore's law, we need much more innovation. So we need a, a, probably a lot more different types of computers built out of chiplets than just, will everything will be whatever Intel makes and we'll, we'll use that everywhere because of this kind of need for specialization. So it's, uh, you know, this is a, like I said, it's back to the future. And, and it, from an outsider's perspective, I don't know if they'll be able to tell uh, what the difference is, but inside the industry, it'd be a, pretty big change. It's like under the hood, you know, it's like uh, automobiles that are driving from combustion engine to electrical battery driven. It looks same, but clearly very different. Yeah. Yeah. It would, yeah. If you op open, yeah, it'd be, it'd be like if you open the hood, instead of seeing one big V8 engine, you open the hood and there were 16 uh, one cylinder engines in, in there uh, driving your car. If you didn't, if you didn't open the hood, you couldn't tell, but if you look inside, you'd be amazed, and that would have a big impact on the automotive industry. Yeah. Well, uh, you also authored several uh, uh, projects and books with Professor Charles Hennessy in the past, and you're getting your 
Turing Award in 2017 in developing the risk architecture was a real a recognition of your contribution. So uh, as a friend of John Hennessy, who was also the, uh, your, your competitor at Stanford, uh, are they, how did you collaborate as a friend and as a competitor in academics perspective? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Uh, uh, he grew up, I mean, what, how are we different? He grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in California. He grew up in, in New York, Long Island uh, there. Uh, the similarities is both of us uh, are the oldest children of large families. You know, mm -hmm. uh, went to church every Sunday. I went to a Presbyterian church. He went to a Catholic church. We arrived at Stanford and Berkeley about the same time. And uh, I think I started on the risk ideas a little before John, but he was... Uh, uh, he was in there almost from the very beginning. And, but, you know, but Stanford and Berkeley are rivals for people in other parts of the world. It'd be like, it'd be like Barcelona and Real Madrid or uh, Arsenal and Manchester United or other parts of the world, you know, rivals. And so the decision we had to decide were we going to kind of remain rivals like our institutions or collaborate because we were on the same side of the argument, right? We believed that these simple vocabularies were the right way to go. And we decided it made sense for us. We wanted more people like us. And so we collaborated right from the very beginning. Um, and, uh, and we just kind of have a common worldview and we just get together and we kind of see the issues the same way. So that, that worked out uh, really well. Uh, we were after, you know, we did a lot of the work on how, to kind of more scientifically design instruction sets before it was kind of done by people's intuition. Um, and we realized the textbooks at the time were kind of catalogs and say, well, here's one computer, it has these features, here's another computer that has these features. And it was really hard to figure out what you should do. So we decided uh, we, we would write a textbook that would kind of capture what we learned about risk processor design and, and, and put up a set of principles in and we did this book together. So it, it, the Turing Award, interestingly enough, is partly for our contributions for risk, but also because of the textbook we did, which is a computer architecture quantitative approach. So it was the book as well as the architecture work that uh, we were recognized for. And, and you know, it's books 30, the first edition was 30 years old. It's on its sixth edition now, and it's still uh, the standard book that every, just about everybody uses uh, to learn computer architecture. So, Absolutely. Yes, uh, it's like a Bible in terms of double E and computer science majors. So last question for you, and really appreciate you sharing your perspective around the where things are. How do you uh, manage? This is more life, uh, it's more like work and life balance question that all of us have to go through. And people like you and I, we all have a lot of opportunities in front of us. And that question has always been central of many of us to figure out over time. So if you can share some of your wisdom, I would really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, well, since I've, uh, you know, senior in my career, I actually give a talk uh, about this and it, it's called How to Have a Bad Career. So it's a tongue and kind of tongue and cheek talk where I kind of take kind of extreme version of conventional wisdom. And if you follow that, you can have a bad career. And then I give the alternative. So I've reflected uh, some of this. Well, first of all, after I was getting my PhD, I had the job offer from Berkeley and I didn't hadn't finished my PhD. I gave you some time to think about things. And fortunately, I came to the conclusion it was going to be family first. Family was number one. Uh, and I, but I made that decision because there's a lot of jobs. If you like what you're doing, there's all kinds of opportunities to keep yourself busy. And if, if you don't make family number one, your family, your family can be, you know, fifth or sixth in the priorities. And I really didn't want to, uh, you know, be 20 years later and not have a good relationship with my family. So I was the soccer coach, the Cub Scout leader. I went on field trips and when you're, I have two sons and when they're adorable young sons turn into unruly teenagers and they said, well, dad, you were never around when I was growing up. So, okay, let's go over this Indian guides, soccer, Cub Scouts, field trips. Oh, okay. You were around, but uh, yeah, but we have, a, I have still have good relationships with my sons. We go for bike rides. Uh, 
I play soccer and one of my sons plays soccer with me on the same team. So, yeah, so uh, I'm so glad, especially I knew going in, I want to do this, but especially at this stage, I'm so glad I've got a good relationship with my family. I'd say the other thing uh, I've got, it's a long speech. I'll, I'll get you through. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Yeah. The other thing that hit me kind of maybe 10 years into career, I kind of woke up one morning and it was like God spoke to me and it was, it's not how many projects you start, it's how many you finish. And it, it's kind of an obvious thing to say, but kind of, I was thunderstruck. And after that, and particularly in academia, it's very easy to volunteer for all kinds of things. I was pretty consistent as I'm gonna do one big thing a year. I, I'm only gonna do one big thing at a time. And it, I don't know how long it'll last, but if it lasts a year or so, I'll do other little things, but only one big thing. So when Hennessy and I wrote our textbook, we did that in less than a year. And because that was the big thing that all of us did. And when I was president of ACM, that was, uh, which is, uh, you know, a competing society, that was the big thing I did. But I think, you know, and then, when, you know, if you do one big thing a year and you, you know, you have a career of 40 years, it looks like you got a lot of stuff done. So people think I'm really productive. I think I'm just more selective. You know, I'm just trying, this is what the main thing I'm working on and I'm, I'll get that done before the next one. And I think a lot of people they try and time multiplex too much and it's hard to make, you know, it's hard to finish things. But like I said, people count what you finish, not what you start. So. Great. That's really good wisdom to share with number of people that are watching this show, which is more the CEOs and entrepreneurs and the people that care about technology that are impacting our lives. And uh, thank you very much for your time and sharing your wisdoms for our next wave of speaker series. Appreciate it. Oh, well, thank, thanks a lot for inviting me. And yeah, especially at my age, I'm, I'm in my se early, se I'm not early 70s, I'm in my 70s now. You really don't want to look back and have regrets. You know, boy, I wish I'd spent more time in my in the office. You're probably not going to want to wish that. So, if executive CEOs, you know, everybody wants to be successful, but you don't have to sacrifice your family to be successful. And and, and if you do, you're it's going to be hard to be successful if you sacrifice your family. So, yes. great. Thank you very much. Great wisdom. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.